came for that or you came uh, despite that. Uh, but I was born and raised in Houston, Texas, and I've been living in New Mexico now for 10 years. Um, I want to thank Tomas for inviting me. Uh, he just mentioned to me that one of the reasons why he started having these talks was so people could come to the library, and, and the library actually where the archives are, and get to know the resources here. And uh, that's how my work began. Um, when I was at UNM, I was taking the course there with uh, Dr. Enrique de Madrid. Some of you uh, might, have know, might know him. Uh, he's my professor and, and one of my mentors. And it was a course on what we call a recovery project, recovery work. In other words, older literature that uh, you would not find on the bookshelves. Uh, and so this project stems from that. And we find, I, I have found resources in this library as well as the, uh, the state records um, and various other locations, the, the UNM uh, Center for Southwest Research and a few other spots. So you, you have to spend time in the libraries to sort of uncover what's there. Now this was already uncovered and so I can't take uh, credit for finding this play but uh, I have worked on it for a while and so there's a lot of gems in our libraries. We just have to go in there and start uncovering it and doing uh, tedious work. Archival work is tedious work but it, it's, it's, it's fun work in a sense. Um, also, want to thank the uh, Francisco Chavez Historical Library for having me, and of course, you wonderful folks for being here today. Um, I'll, before I begin, I want to state that I'm not an historian. I don't consider myself an historian. I'm a professor of literature. But when you study literature, you, you have to know and appreciate the history. You really can't separate the two. Um, and so, especially when you study uh, literature that we would consider recovery literature, and so literature that is older, you have to understand the social context of that time in order to really appreciate the play. Now that being said, uh, as a professor of literature, and for those of you who are here to hear about the play, the play deviates from historical record. And so what we have is, as the history is distinct from the play, and for a number of reasons that I'll, I'll mention in a bit. Uh, I also wanted to... Uh, just to, I wanted to mention that and how, once again, th those are two different types of uh, cultural production, the history and the literature. And so the eyes of Texas are upon us, the New Mexico folk play Los Tejanos, and the history of Texan invasions. I'll start off first by giving an historical background of the Texas uh, Santa Fe expedition, and then the second half will be more based on the play. But in order to do that, like I mentioned, you do have to appreciate the history. So I want to give a general background of a little bit of New Mexico. Many of you are, are probably familiar with this. Not just the history, but a little bit about um, the literary production that has taken place in this state for generations. New Mexico has a long and rich cultural and literary history. I would argue that we have one of the richest histories in the United States. I am sure many of you today would agree with me. We are home to one of the longest inhabited communities in the United States in the Pueblo of Acoma, founded and inhabited since 1150 AD. We are also home to the first capital city, uh, which is here, of course, in Santa Fe, which was established in 1610. That's the first capital, not the longest continuous capital. We'd have to give the credit to Boston for that in New England. Um, in New Mexico also lies the origins of the first Euro-American literary works. Ada Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, who traveled through New Mexico after being shipwrecked off the coast of Galveston and traveling to the southwest for eight years, published an account of his journey entitled La Relacion, which was published in 1542. If, if you recognize the name but not the work, he republished that, that journal or that, that, that uh, cronica um, as called uh, Nafragios, which means shipwrecks. So already we see a play with titles, right? La Relacion, the account, not as clever as shipwrecks, which would have been a better seller than that day. Uh, Juan Donate, a controversial historical figure, to say the least, who helped settle and establish New Mexico, ordered the didactic play Moros y Cristianos to be performed uh, once they basically settled into New Mexico. Gaspar Perez de Diagra, who came into New Mexico as part of the Oñate expedition, wrote and published La Historia de Mexico in 1610. Out of all these complex relationships and histories, is, is a born a place and other privilege to call home for 10 years, New Mexico. But I know this place well enough to know that 10 years does not earn me the right 
to call myself Nuevo Mexicano. I am still at Tejano. For, the, for those of you who are transplants or have been here even for 10 years, like myself, uh, you probably noticed that it takes a couple of generations to really call yourself New Mexican for some folks, which is fine. So today I'm here to talk about a little known <coughs> folk play called Los Tejanos, the Texans, and some of the history that surrounds it. As a teacher, I hope that we can use this bit of history and obscure theatrical piece to, ho to hopefully apply it to our lives and help us understand how to better make decisions that affect us and our world today. Uh, when I teach literature, I don't really, I try not to just look at the work. I like to look at the work and the context and then also how, how can we, what do we learn from it in our own, about our own lives and how can we apply it to our own lives. And I really think when we, when we look at the, the Texas Hemp Expedition and some of the mistakes they made, I think that you could easily apply it to many of the things that happen in the world today. The states of New Mexico and Texas may be neighbors, but they, they have not always been neighborly. In fact, during the period between 1836, when Texas gained its independence from Mexico, to the second year of the Civil War in 1862, Texas mounted four different military attacks on New Mexico. When I moved here um, 10 years ago and I heard jokes about Texans and little things about Texans, I didn't quite get it. I didn't know that we had this sort of conflict uh, between the two states. But as I learned the history, I understood why. Um, and so you really do have to learn the history to understand the complex relationship between Texas and Mexico. It really dates back. Uh, well over a century. All four attacks, as we know, were unsuccessful. The first invasion, and the most renowned, was a Texas Santa Fe expedition which took place in 1841. The second and third military incursions involved two minor attacks along the Santa Fe Trail that were designed to gain retaliation from, uh, for the embarrassment of the ill-fated Texas Santa Fe expedition. These were the Warfield Expedition and the Snidely Expedition, both in 1843. The World World Expedition actually entered New Mexico territory while the Snyder Expedition attacked merchants along the Santa Fe Trail near the Arkansas River in Kansas. Both expeditions were short-lived and unsuccessful as they returned to Texas without gaining any clear military victory. The last military foray into New Mexico occurred during the Civil War when Union soldiers, including five regiments of New Mexico Volunteer Infantry, and two regiments of New Mexico militia repelled a Confederate force of two to three hundred Texans at Glorieta Pass, southeast of Santa Fe, in 1862. Part of the reason for the failed military incursions by the Texas forces, despite having superior weaponry and a call of manifest destiny, was the lack of knowledge about the difficult terrain they had to trek in order to, to arrive deep into New Mexico territory. Even before the first Euro-American settlements in New Mexico, the region had been sparsely populated, with the Spanish-Mexican population growing modestly during the centuries of exploration and colonization. However, even this growth was counteracted by the decline of Indian Pueblos and their inhabitants. As time passed, Spanish settlements developed into established communities huddled around the area's three main rivers, Rio Grande, Rio Grande the Pecos, and Canadian. However, these communities continued to remain isolated from the Spanish central government, a trend that continued once Mexico became independent as Mexico City was far removed from its northern territories. And we can imagine, um, if anybody's ever traveled to Mexico or along the, or the border region, um, I've, I've taken bus from Mexico City to, to Texas. It's a long trip by bus alone. So if we can imagine the, those years back then of having the centralized government in Mexico City, um, New Mexico was far removed from its connection to the centralized Mexico government, and, and thus really had to, to sort of forge its own identity. With a continued isolation, rugged lifestyle, and subsistence living as the primary way of life, New Mexicans began to develop a society that became distinctly their own. It is due to the separation from the rest of the Spanish Empire, and later Mexico, that New Mexico was forced to establish its own ideological political and cultural identity, particularly northern New Mexico. Um, for those of you who have traveled the state, we all know that southern New Mexico is, is kind of distinct in its own way, and that, that line, somewhere along Socorro, divides the two. And so northern New Mexico is really the part that was even more secluded, because southern New Mexico at least had more contact with Mesilla and Chihuahua. 
In order for this territory to survive, despite being neglected by the centralized government of New Mexico City, the people of New Mexico needed to create a sense of identity and cultural values. This was achieved on various levels, particularly through the cultural practices and performances that developed through their mythology and oral tradition, often stemming from actual historic events. These cultural markers, are, as defined by New Mexico history, can be found in a cultural practice that has had a profound and meaningful role in developing this regional identity, which is secular theater. We also have many plays that have uh, religious overtones, but particularly secular theater has a different focus. This cultural space where history and performance converge is brought to life in three secular plays of New Mexico, Moros de Cristianos, Los Comanches, and Los Tejanos. All three plays have historical roots within New Mexico and were utilized to further develop its distinct regional character. Out of those here, how many of you are familiar with the play Moros de Cristianos? Do you have about the play Los Comanches? Okay. Moros de Cristianos uh, has been played before, has, many times in New Mexico, but it has not been staged in, the, in the, uh, maybe the last 10 years, more or less. But they do, if anybody enjoys traveling, um, has anybody been to Zacatecas? It's a beautiful town in northern Mexico. Um, they put that play on every year, and it includes any, uh, at least 500 people, but closer to 2,000. Um, you can Google it, uh, you can find videos, just type in, Moros and Cristianos, or Cristianos, Moors and Christians, uh, Zacatecas, and you'll find that play, and there's documentaries on the play, full length and everything. Uh, it's very, very fascinating. They get in full regalia, it takes weeks to prepare, their lines are memorized, and so it's, it's slightly different than the play that was performed here, but it's the same, basically the same play. Los Comanches, if anybody wants to see that play, they can still see it. It's performed every year. Has anyone seen that play performed? Yes, yeah, the one in Alcalde. Uh, it's performed every year, um, usually a few days before Christmas, maybe the 20th, 21st, all the way up to the 23rd. Um, in Alcalde, which is near Española, it's done completely in Spanish, the original language, on horseback. Um, it's an equestrian play. And so what you have is essentially the Comanches versus the, the native uh, non-Mexicanos, the, the Spanish, if you will. And it's, it's basically the called harangues, right, Angus, where one side says they're, they've conquered so-and-so, and the other side, it's their turn to say who they are and who they've conquered until they go back and forth and the Spanish prevail. And so that play is still alive and well, and I recommend you see it because um, most of the men that do it are older, and so it does take uh, a training of a younger generation to keep it going, and so who knows how much longer it will survive, but it does seem to be uh, well established. As I mentioned, all three plays have historical roots within New Mexico and were utilized to further develop its distinct regional character. Los Tejanos, as I'll mention, uh, is not currently staged, and we don't know if it ever has been, actually. In January 1598, Don Juan de Oñate and an expedition of 129 soldiers left Zacatecas, Mexico, and headed north to settle New Mexico. No Mexico. So we have a long history with Zacatecas. Um, when people say there are Spaniards or Spanish or Spanish American, there's a reason for it. There are various reasons. But these men and women and children, servants, slaves, came at one point, many of them were Zacatecas. Some were Spanish born, many were Mexican born of Spanish parents. And so there's a long connection there with the community out. Um, that goes all the way to Zacatecas. And so there's a tradition there that uh, definitely deserves much more recognition and research. Also included were the wives, children, servants, and slaves of several of the officers. On April 30th, 1598, Oñate's expedition crossed the present day of Rio Grande near El Paso. Four months later, they settled in the Pueblo of Oque, Perengue, renamed the Pueblo of San Juan de los Caballeros near present day Española. One of the first acts of possession that Oñate commanded was for his men to perform a didactic play, a play that had the purpose of teaching something which they did after crossing the Rio Grande and the pond settling in northern New Mexico. This play was a version of Moros y Cristianos, which depicted the battle between Muslim Moors and Spanish Christians at the Battle of Granada in 1492. The play reenacts the reestablishment of Christian dominance in Spain 
as the Spanish Christians drove Moorish invaders from the Iberian Peninsula. Although this play has European origins, it was significant for many reasons, particularly because it represents one of the first Euro-American literary productions to take place in the Americas. But for the future of the region, and in particular of New Mexico, this play established a pattern of cultural identity between the forces of, quote, good and evil that would continue to develop in New Mexico all the way through the 20th century. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the play was used to integrate Native Americans into the Catholic faith and serve under Spanish rule, as they often played the role of the Christian warriors, while the Spaniards took the role of the invading Moors. These victorious performances of Christianity over their previous oppressors created an important ideological coherence that continued on for many generations of Roma Mexicanos and established a clear pattern that is also present in the other two regional plays. So with this play, Los Cristianos, Los Comanches, Saint and Los Tejanos, uh, particularly with uh, the first two, they're, di they're didactic in nature. The purpose is to teach something. And the tradition goes all the way back to Spain. And here they are using the Native Americans as actors. And they put them in the role of the conquering Spaniards, right? Maybe to give them a sense of uh, that they belong, but also to get them involved in teaching. If anybody works with theater, you know it's a great tool for teaching a number of things, and that's what the Spaniards were doing. It's literature, but they're using it as a tool. In the play Los Comanches, the focus remains on the Spanish no Mexicano forces led by Don Carlos Fernandez that overcome the fierce Comanches and their infamous leader, Pueblo Verde, in a battle in 1779. So the battle of 1779, we're in 2011, the play will be performed again. So we can see the long historical roots that New Mexico has as far as literature, and it's, it continues, it thrives. This battle reflects the cultural differences between the growing population of Spanish Nuevo Mexicano settlers and the nomadic Comanches who ruled much of New Mexico, southern Colorado, and West Texas. This play is based on the true events of New Mexico during the time as Hispanic settlers and Pueblo Indians often united and lived in close quarters to help defend themselves from the Comanches who were greatly feared and rightfully so as they routinely attacked and pillaged Hispano and Pueblo communities. Oftentimes we see uh, every group as distinct and separate, but in this case, many times the, the New Mexicans and the Pueblo Indians work together, live together, in order to defend themselves from the Comanches. And so, you know, just because one group uh, is more similar to the other, it doesn't mean that they weren't feared or didn't have to work together with the group who was different to work as allies. Once again, the No Mexicanos portrayed in this historical play consolidate their forces to defeat a formidable enemy and protect their settlements, thus defending their burgeoning homeland. The play Los Tejanos follows a pattern similar to that of Moros and Cristianos and Los Comanches. Los Tejanos also depicts a military victory by Los Mexicanos over an encroaching and aggressive enemy. However, there are two main distinctions that separate this play from Moros and Cristianos and Los Comanches. The first two uh, plays, from the perspectives of their authors, attempt to demonstrate the dominance of morally and militarily supported forces over, quote, barbaric invaders. In contrast, Los Tejanos shows how the times have changed as Spanish descendants and Native Americans worked together to defeat their Texan foes, who in this case most likely viewed the New Mexicans as inferior, both culturally and militarily. The other element that differs from the first two plays is the fact that the New Mexican militia, during the time of the Texas Antiquity Expedition of 1841, was not as strong as its predecessors, and because of this, they had to rely more on uh, more than military might, but also clever strategy and trickery, at least according to the play. And so that's the big difference that we'll see is, is not so much, uh, this really wasn't a military victory per se, according to the play. It was, uh, if you will, an intellectual victory. And so that uh, has much more, that shows much more in favor of the New Mexicans uh, than the Texans. So now I want to get into the historical background and talk about the actual Texas Santa Fe expedition. Uh, not in complete detail because there are many things that can be said about it, but just enough to understand the, the situation, the context, and that way we can appreciate the play and also the play deviate from the actual recorded historical events that we have according to the various testimonies that exist. 
The historic time period in which the play occurs is during the era when Texas was a newly formed republic and under its second president, Nero V. Lamar. It is well documented that Lamar was very interested in expanding Texas' territory into New Mexico to benefit from the booming trade along the Santa Fe Trail and the economic prosperity it presented. Aside from the economic benefits, Lamar was also known as a strong proponent of Texas nationalism and expansion. During his tumultuous presidency, relations with Mexico became further strained, and it is well documented that he intended to push Texas' border westward. Lamar also held an incredibly strong position against Native Americans, attempting and succeeding in many cases to eradicate them from Texas. In fact, uh, at the time, it was illegal to be Indian in Texas. And so, uh, you know, what you have to do is, you know, if, if you're essentially not killed, you either have to move to Mexico, which may be as dangerous, or you become Mexican overnight. And so we have a lot of uh, Native American people who uh, have Hispanic last names, and for a reason. There's various reasons, but that, in Texas, that's one reason. Ironically, his hate-based campaign against the Comanches would eventually help derail the Texas Santa Fe expedition. Um, is anybody else here from Texas, by chance? Okay. And so some of you may have heard of uh, Lamar. Uh, he was the second president, as I mentioned. Uh, Sam Houston was the first. Sam Houston was known to create uh, alliances with Native Americans. He was known as a person who tried to understand Native American culture to a degree, much more so than Lamar. Lamar was the exact opposite. Um, growing up in Houston, I actually went to Lamar High School. Um, and I don't think anybody, at least that I know of, tried to um, figure out who he was beyond the second president because our mascot was the Redskins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't realize how long it was until years later. During Lamar's presidency, fresh from the war with Mexico, the Republic of Texas was suffering severe economic problems with a depleted treasury and its sole diplomatic recognition coming from the United States. Lamar needed to create some sort of stimulus. In 1841, with the Republic near bankruptcy, Lamar authorized a military expedition to New Mexico, which became known as the Texas Santa Fe Expedition. So this goes into what can we learn from it, right? These are mistakes that happen all throughout history but we seldom really look at them. I mean, we talk about the cliche of knowing history or, or, or thus being doomed to repeat it, but we really seldom analyze history the way we should. Although Lamar's intention of extending the Texas territory was based on greed and manifest destiny, he also felt that Texas had a legitimate claim to much of New Mexico as interpreted by the conditions presented in the Treaty of Velasco. Signed, in, uh, signed May 14, 1836, at the conclusion of the Texas War for Independence from Mexico. According to Article 3 of the treaty, the Mexican territory was bound by the Rio Grande and all uh, the Northern Territory, uh, or everything north of the Rio Grande, pertained to Texas. And so there becomes a big conflict, because we all know from Texas, basically, the goal, the Rio Grande does pretty much go east to west, gradually moving north. But as soon as it's El Paso, it's south to north. And so Mexico saw as everything just north, whereas Texas saw everything north and east. And so uh, we're going to goes all the way to Colorado. And so we'll see a map in a bit, and that'll give us an idea of what Texas thought they had the right to. Aside from the immediate economic benefits that would be gained by seizing control of the Santa Fe Trail, Lamar also received reports that there were many New Mexicans who were in favor of a Texas invasion that would result and their independence from Mexico. To investigate these claims, Lamar appointed three residents of Santa Fe, William G. Dryden, John Rowland, and William Workman as commissioners for Texas, sending a letter with them in April 1840 to invite New Mexicans to join the Republic of Texas. Dryden's account confirms what Lamar had already believed, that Texas had the moral obligation to invade New Mexico. Dryden reports back to Lamar stating, quote, every American and more than two-thirds of the Mexicans and all of the Pueblo Indians are with us heart and soul. And whenever they have heard of you sending troops, there had been rejoicing. The play has true historic significance, and not just for New Mexico, but for all of the United States when examining the findings by Dryden and the course of action that was taken afterwards. 
This is especially true when we consider that Lamar was also motivated to invade New Mexico due to the fact that Texas was suffering an economic depression that he hoped to relieve by expanding Texan interests and securing the Santa Fe trade route. Soon after receipt of, the, of, this new, of these news, Lamar proceeded with the expedition, despite the congressional vote against it in 1841. The military leader of the expedition was General Hugh McCloy, a graduate of West Point. Second in command was a notorious Indian fighter, Major uh, George Thomas Howard. It is noteworthy that both McCloy and Howard played leading roles in the notorious Council House fight at San Antonio in 1840, in which the Comanche Peace Delegation, including five women and children, was entrapped and massacred during negotiations with the Texans. So here in New Mexico, we have various different Native American groups. In Texas, there are really very few. Most of them are, are really coming out now and sort of investigating um, what their, their background is. And one of the reasons is because uh, Lamar, and also for the Comanches, this particular fight, because uh, they were, many of them were massacred, and they realized that Texas was not a good place to be. Um, the last group in Texas, the, the Comanche group, was in Palo Verde. And when they were captured, they were sent to uh, Oklahoma. Whereas in New Mexico, um, in northern New Mexico, uh, Comanche and Indians continued to live and thrive for, for many, many years. The Texan forces that made up the expedition included five companies of infantry and one of artillery. The expedition included four appointed commissioners, William G. Cook, Richard F. Brenham, George Van Ness, and Jose Antonio Navarro, and a number of merchants. Navarro, a native of San Antonio, was a sole prominent Hispano to accompany the expedition. Although Navarro once served in the Mexican government, he had, he had eventually supported Texas independence and was one of three Mexicans to sign the Declaration of Independence in 1836. The other two included Jose Francisco Ruiz and Lorenzo de Zavala. And that's important because this war is not necessarily Anglo-Texan versus Hispano New Mexico. Um, Navarro was a, a big part of the war. Um, and he was from Mexico. And we'll learn more about him in a bit. But um, especially with Texas independence, it, it wasn't all uh, Anglo-Texans. And really, most of the Texans that fought for independence were not even from Texas. Most of them were from out of state, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, um, other states, southern states. But uh, the few, the only actual native Texans that died at the Alamo, native Texans, right, born in Texas, that died at the Alamo, on the Texan side were Texas Mexicans. Right? But we don't ever hear about those folks. So it's important to realize that uh, these wars cross uh, color lines. But we should also realize that people fought on both sides. And who were those people? And who were, and what was their significance? It's really important to, to realize uh, the complexity behind these histories. Two significant non-Texans who accompanied the expedition included Thomas Falconer, a British lawyer recently arrived in Texas, and George Wilkins Kendall, <clears throat> a journalist for the New Orleans Picayune Times, both Falconer and Kendall later published important book length accounts of the expedition, from which much of what is known of the ill-fated expedition um, that has been learned. The Texas Hand Expedition departed Austin on June 20, 1841. The expedition included 320 men, 14 wagons, and one howitzer. McCloy had originally planned and this is, this is kind of uh, humorous in a way, for those of you who traveled to Texas, had originally planned an expedition to cover 500 miles to Santa Fe, which became more than 1,000 after backtracking and misdirection. So I'm from Houston, so going to Houston, we go quite often. Anybody who's ever driven to Houston or Austin knows it's, it's easily 900 miles from central New Mexico. Um, and it's a difficult, to tiring drive, much <laughs> less by horseback or foot or wagon with all kinds of equipment. Traveling, if you will, uh, uphill, up mountain, and there are other problems, as, as we'll see in a bit. Despite New, New Mexico Governor Amico's legitimate concern over the intimate Texas invasion, it turned out that the Texan army was ill-prepared for the journey. McCloy's appointment to lead the expedition was beneficial to New Mexico because the Texan army has suffered tremendously under its poor leadership and planning. Testimony showed that his men endured extreme hardship, including hunger, constant Indian attacks, and undisciplined troops. Much of the suffering was due to the lack of knowledge that McCloy and his men had about the terrain they were attempting to overtake. 
Another problem that arose was the lack of adequate grass and water because they had left too late in the year. Another sign of inadequate planning. <clears throat> the Texan army was poorly equipped to travel such a distance through a high desert terrain and then have the energy to fight a war. But what may have been the Texans' largest detriment was their hubris. In real life, Anne is portrayed in the play. In fact, Lamar did not even attempt to make secretist plans of invasion as newspapers in Austin and St. Louis, uh, St. Louis published reports about the expedition. On contrast, New Mexico sought any advantage it could muster, including allying itself with their previous enemies. What is unique about Los Tejanos as, is that it distinguishes itself from the other two plays is that New Mexicans and Native Americans joined forces in order to protect themselves, uh, in order to protect Native New Mexico, their Native New Mexico. Ironically enough, it was the fierce Comanches who had battled the Spanish New Mexicans in the previous century that aided them this time by wreaking havoc as they constantly harassed the Texas expedition. In fact, based on historical documents, two Comanche Indians were the first to report the position of the Texans on September 11, 1841, as they neared the New Mexico capital. Four days later, two Texan deserters arrived in Santa Fe, a positive sign that the Texas expedition was exhausted and with low morale. This was very fortunate for Amico's command because his army was also in poor condition but they did not have to tread through the desert with Comanches pursuing them. From an amigo's perspective, he had much to worry about with little support from the Mexican government and an undersized New Mexico military. The Presidio in Santa Fe listed only 107 men as of March 1840, and the militia was in worse condition. Santa Fe did show 507 men as part of the militia, but only 34 of those were categorized as con armas en mano, with arms in hand. Unfortunately for Aramijos, Santa Fe did not fare any better than the other jurisdictions as San Juan, Rio Abajo, Albuquerque, and Cochetigo under similar situations. By the time the Comanches had reported the Texans' location, Aramijo was prepared. Citizens and spies were on the lookout for the invading Texans. In Taos, the militia was organized and commanded by Juan of Chuleta. And Santa Fe, Antonio Sandoval began to fill in as the head of state so Armijo could lead his men to San Miguel. Armijo was finally able to intercept news on the progress of the Texans with the cooperation of two Texan guides who made it to Santa Fe after deserting the expedition in September 1841. By the time the Texans arrived to eastern New Mexico, they were a ragged, weak excuse for an invading force as they were starved, many sick with scurvy, and incapable of fighting the war. The truth of the matter was that the Texans were defeated before they ever reached this point, which is evidenced by the actions of General McCoy himself. On August 30th, 1841, at Camp Resolution, General McCoy decided to divide the command. This was noted in a narrative by journalist George Wilkins Kendall, who wrote, quote, we were completely lost and without power moving forward. Our provisions were now almost entirely exhausted, with only poor beef enough for each day to support nature. And in addition, we were surrounded by a large and powerful tribe of well-mounted Indians. And so with the Comanches, they were the enemies before the Plato's Comanches, just a century before. Um, here, the Comanches are their allies, uh, and they're helping defend New Mexico, and it's noted in the narrative, and it's noted in the play um, to an extent with the different, uh, with the Pecos Indians, not the Comanche Indians. McCloy made a difficult decision because the troops were starving and in no shape to continue the long, arduous journey. The plan was for the McCloy party to stay behind with his men, while the others would march ahead and find sufficient food and water to take back and then call for the remainder of the troops to join them. McCloy sent Captain William Cook with approximately 100 of the strongest men and provisions for five days from March ahead to San Miguel. However, what was supposed to be a five-day trip extended into a two-week disaster. On September 16th, an advance group of five Texans from the Cook Party was captured by Captain Damasio Salazar and his command of 68 Mexicans. On September 17th, Salazar found the remainder of the Cook Party at Anton Chico. The Cook Party eventually surrendered to Salazar as they were promised that they would not be taken prisoners and provided food. Aside from the appealing terms for surrender, 
the Texans feared that Amico's army of 3,000 men would arrive the next day. At least they thought he had 3,000 men. Amico did arrive the next day with far less men than expected. And it was later decided that Amico and his officers uh, would march the captured Texans 2,000 miles to Mexico City as prisoners of war. So this is a historical fact, right? Uh, the play pokes fun at all this. Uh, but the fact is, after going all the way to uh, central and so northern Mexico from Austin, they have to march to Mexico City. Uh, and we can, I mean, that's, that's almost unbearable to think about. Uh, but that was their punishment and being jailed afterwards. After uh, the successful surrender of the first group of Texan, Texans, Arnico made his headquarters at Las Vegas and strategized on how to capture the remainder of the Texan force. One of the rest of Chuleta and the small reconnaissance party searched for the Texans and found them at Laguna Colorada on October 4th. He called for their immediate surrender, but McCloy wanted time to consult with his men. That evening, McCloy was further influenced by the, by the to surrender by the arrival of 60 rurales from Taos that joined Archibald's men to strengthen the Mexican forces to 233. So it wasn't even really a huge force, but by that time, uh, they didn't have many uh, options. It is uncertain as to the exact date, but on October 4th or 5th, Archibald accepted the surrender of the Texans and confiscated their cannon and arms. On the following day, the weaker portion of the Texan, Texan expedition led by McCloy and second in command, Arturo Navarro, also began the difficult march to Mexico City. Um, and there's much more that goes beyond that. What I find fascinating, and happened with other figures in Texas, like Juan Seguin, is uh, with the Texans, the Anglo-Texans, it's one thing to consider prisoners of war. With men like Antonio Navarro, they're, look, they're, they're seen as traitors. Um, Antonio Navarro spent many years in prison. Eventually, uh, he escaped uh, during some political uh, problems in Mexico and was able to return to Texas. But similar things happened to uh, Juan Seguin, who fought for the Texas Revolution. So we have uh, political figures who, what are they? Right? They're not Anglo-Texans, they're not Texans, they're Tejanos, they're Mexican. They actually fought for the Mexican side at one time. And so they're really uh, what we call in Chicano literature, uh, between two worlds. And before I get to the play, I'll just show a few slides, and we'll get an idea of uh, some of the figures, just to see some, some portraits of them and a few maps. Can't see us, but if you can see, uh, that's uh, basically the way the Republic of Texas saw um, the rest of, of Texas territory. Uh, that red line, uh, basically, uh, that would be what they considered to be Texas, whereas of course uh, Mexico did not. And if you, some maps, I think maybe I'll have one shows Texas going all the way to part of Wyoming. And there it is, right there. So. Uh, Texans always have a way of looking at things in, in, in a bigger picture. <laughs> so here, uh, Texans would have been pretty huge if that were the case. And we actually would have had our own uh, ski resorts, too. <laughs> uh, here you can see a different map. Uh, and basically, it shows the route to where they got to northern Mexico, and then the route straight down to Mexico City that, that they would have taken, which I can't imagine. Uh, what kind of trip that would have been. Uh, it's a different map, but it's basically uh, the same route, right? The map going to Santa Fe, and then the map traveling back down to Mexico City. Here is a portrait of Governor Manuel Armijo. Uh, as we mentioned in the play, I'll mention that during this time, yeah, he was a popular figure, but it wasn't too long after that. I mean, 1846 was his third term. And that's the start of the U.S.-Mexico War. And so after that, he would have not been a popular figure because the United States basically takes over. Uh, and that, in New Mexico, least, was not much of a war. It was more of a, a surrender. Here's a picture of uh, Mirabu Lamar. And uh, no one better know about him. It seems like his, his, his look matches his character, but who knows? The B is for Bonaparte. Yes, that's true. Uh, General Hugh McCloy. Uh, I have to read more about McCloy because I just found a book recently that, that looks at him as a hero, actually. Um, but one of these things depends on what side of history you're on. 
uh, but another fascinating figure and, and Texas uh, historical figure. I think the uh, once again, I, I consider these particular uh, figures very important and interesting because they're always between two worlds. Right? How do you fight for the Texan side when you from Mexico? Um, but obviously they had they had their own interest in mind. I mean, these were landed gentry. They were not uh, campesinos. Navarro uh, had a lot to gain by going with Texas. Um, so they do it for personal reasons as well, and not necessarily for oh. tribes. They also changed. Um, I'm, I'm a granddaughter of Oh, great. And in the Congress, when Texas took over, te when, the, when all the land people came into Texas after the Alamo, uh -huh. their Congress tried to disenfranchise Latinos. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And he was the person who maintained the vote for Latinos. It, it's, like I said, it's a difficult position to be in once again in the same boat because you can go all the way from New Mexico, Arizona, and California. Um, California, um, Vallejo would have been the figure there in the town of uh, Vallejo, but Vallejo has a great uh, piece um, that is called My History, Not Well, it's, it's a book that's based on his, his account called My History, Not Yours, where it's the same thing, where these are landed gentry, but they lose a lot of power and a lot of land uh, once uh, the U.S. or Texas takes over. Um, and they're seen as traitors by Texans and, and Americans as well, because they think, well, maybe they're, they're serving as spies for Mexico. And so they're in a very difficult position their entire lives. And um, I don't envy that position, but um, I do, uh, as, a, as a literary uh, scholar, I'm very glad that they pin their stories uh, that they wrote. Um, Seguin wrote his narrative. Um, Navarro, there's a lot written about Navarro, and there's, uh, there's letters as well. And so there's a lot there that has to be uncovered. And there's definitely not black and white. There's a lot of gray, a lot of gray. And so now I'll talk about the play, and if anybody's interested, I can go over the slides that are wrong. Um, a lot of that was just found on, on Google Images. You can, it takes a while, but you can find some. And of course, we have uh, many things on, in the archives as well. So very little is known about the play Los Bahamas. The script was recovered in the summer of 1931 by historian, folklorist, Aurelio Espanosa and uh, Jose Manuel Espanosa, which is actually a father and son. Uh, the Aurelio Espinosa was known as a, one of our top, our first top-notch uh, folklorist, and he's done a lot of work and, and sort of his son about New Mexico folklore, and even folklore in California, because they both work in California. Um, they attained the script from Bonifacio Ortega of Chimayo, New Mexico, who stored it in a trunk with other manuscripts and family letters. The sole manuscript ever to be re recovered of Los Tejanos consists of six small folios with a total of 24 pages. According to Elena Espinosa, the manuscript was probably not the original, and the date of its composition was most likely soon after the historic Texan invasion of 1841, but before 1846, when the New Mexican governor, Mijo, was still a popular hero. And so, you know, with, with, with recovery work, we call recovery work is going to the archives, um, finding documents that have essentially been misplaced or lost or not found or, or unheard of, but also going to people's homes, your parents' homes, your grandparents' homes, and finding their letters, their documents. Um, and all that is powerful stuff because in today's age, how many of us sit down and actually write a letter on paper? It's very seldom. Um, I don't know what we're going to put in, uh, in the future uh, collections of somebody because it's just going to be emails. Uh, but back in the day, at least you had correspondences, and people took the time out to write long correspondences that detailed many things, and uh, there's just a lot of rich material that still can be collected in many uh, private uh, holdings. Um, however, despite the script's existence, there was no proof that the play was actually staged. The main reason why it is believed that it was performed is because Espinosa noted that the manuscript he collected showed signs of considerable handling which led him to believe that it may have served as an acting script. The, the surrender by McCloy and the Texas expedition of the New Mexican forces is the historical fact on which the play is based. Although the play is grounded on true historical, the true historical event of the Texas Senate expedition of 1841, the playwright does take a thorough license to fictionalize some aspects of the event that neither um, 
are not recorded nor agree with the commonly accepted historical version of the event. So we don't know who wrote the play as well. And Tomas, let me know if, uh, how I'm doing on time. According to most scholars in historical narratives, such as that of Kendall, McCloy decided to surrender to Andres Ochilet on October 5, 1841, after they had guaranteed their safety as prisoners of war. However, the play Los Tejanos depicts a far more interesting outcome. In fact, it was not a bloodless surrender, as thought to be, but rather a clever ruse that tricks McCloy into having no other resource but to surrender. Los Tejanos, unlike Muros de Cristianos and Los Comanches, does not aim to show how New Mexico won the battle through military might, but rather through its ingenuity. The purpose of the play, in some ways, is to show how the superior intelligence of the New Mexicans, and in particular, Governor Armijo, and how they were able to deceive the Texans into an easy defeat. However, it is noteworthy that Armijo does not even appear in the play. In fact, there are only four key characters in the play, and three auxiliary, auxiliary roles. The key figures are General McCloy, who is referred to in the play as Menclaude. And so they're playing with the Spanish and how you would pronounce his name, McCloy to Menclaude. Navarro, and it's just Navarro, and they spell his name with a B in the middle instead of a B, but that's typical in, in, in most Spanish across the world. Uh, Indio, and it just says Indio, which is a, a Pecos Indian, and Don Jorge, who is actually uh, an Andalus. He's from Andalusia. Southern Spain, so he's not really New Mexican. He's also an out outsider, and those are interesting roles, Indian and Monora, because uh, they're, they're not New Mexican, and th that's for a reason, and we'll see that in a bit. The play begins with the capture of a Pecos Indian, who was questioned by Menclaude and Navarro to find out if he knows any valuable information about the vanguard Texan force that was sent on a scouting mission. <coughs> Hence, from the beginning, the play diverts from the known historical event, as there is no mention in any official records of any particular Pecos Indian that is captured or spoken of. Navarro begins to deal with the Indian and tries to get some information out of him. However, the Indian is no fool, and he asks for goods in exchange for information. Now, what we have to realize is the play, like most plays, if not all plays, has to entertain at some point. It has to be entertaining or else people aren't going to want to watch it. And so it plays a lot with the language, it plays a lot with the characters, it plays a lot with the lines. Um, and so it's, it's meant to, to, get, uh, to get something from the audience, a reaction from the audience. The play is carefully constructed as it takes into account the Indian speech and makes it more colorful in Spanish. So this is probably done for two reasons. First, to add an element of colloquialism to Indian's broken Spanish, which allows the author to poke fun and create some comic relief for the audience. But perhaps more likely and significant is to make the Indian seem to seem to appear foolish and dumb, which allows the Texan to be duped into trusting the Indian and falling into his trap. The Indian begins his bartering as he states, and I'll, I'll do some in Spanish and do some in English in Spanish. And the Spanish is a little difficult to read because of the spelling, and you have to look at it uh, really well sometimes. Um, pues, mira, Tata, yo para ta palitica, quiero me pongas camisa, haz que almadón, y todito de verdad, yo te dirá como pasas, pero antes de empezar, también madolón muy cuadra. Then, dear father, I will tell you, <clears throat> but before I start my march, I should like a shirt, sincerely, even if it has no starch. And I'll speak the truth most surely, tell you it just as it transpired. But before I start, I tell you, I'd like a pair of pants, too. <laughs> <laughs> the conversation goes back and forth for a while, and so my glad decides to kill the Indian, and as he, as he has nothing of strategic value to offer. McLeod also states, by taking the Indian's life, it will be repayment for three Texans who were killed stealing corn that the Indian had confessed to witnessing. While pleading for his life, the Indians offer some potentially valuable information. The Indian states to Navarro, Compadre, por Dios te pido que no me dejes matar. Yo acusará agora, agora, como Ramírez, ahí está. Don Jorge Asina se llama. Yo todo lo enseñará. Compadre, I implore you, for God's sake, don't let me die. And I tell you, and not Terry, what Ramirez does now hide. He is also called Don Jorge. I shall show him then to you. 
Menklada Navarro discussed the possibility of what truth lies behind the Indian's words and how beneficial it could be to capture this Don Jorge as he is very knowledgeable according to the Indian. Menklada thus orders Navarro, quote, Interesa tu al indio para que pueda entregar a ese hombre que nos escribe de ciencia particular. So a lot of it, there, there's, there's a rhyme going to the Spanish as well, which is very, very common for the plays and literature, poetry at that time. Navarro, and so he's telling him to, 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 to uh, bring the Indian in that we can tell us about this, this man he's telling us about. Navarro then plans to bribe the Indian even further so that he can lead them to Don Jorge. Navarro says, Ven acá, Andito, te quiero gratificar. Tú me, que me enseñas ese hombre para con quien él platicar. Mira que es lo tan lindo te quiero regalar. Come here, my dear Indian friend. I want to gratify you and for you to show me that man so I can talk with him. See this beautiful watch I want to give you? The Indian is taken back by the watch, but he is aware of the deception that Navarro is planning. The Indian takes him directly to Don Jorge's hiding spot and states, Aquí está, señor, el hombre que yo prometí enseñar. Here, is the, here, sir, is the man I promised to reveal. Don Jorge, with good reason, degrades the Indian for his failure to keep a secret. Menglada provides Don Jorge with an offer if he cooperates and gives him information as to the whereabouts of Armijo. So here we see the use of spies, uh, trying to bribe spies to get information, which is a big part of uh, warfare. Como también si se porta con decencia y probidad, le hago merced de la vida, llamas con conducirá a mis, a mis expensas a Texas, y allí se le propondrá un destino muy lucroso donde usted puede pasar a sus anchuras la vida haciéndose nacional. If you behave with honor and decency, I will grant you mercy on your life, and I'll also take you to Texas at my expense and live a lucrative life where you can live in leisure as a citizen. So, uh, you know, that's the bribe, is to go back to Texas and become a Texan. <laughs> Don Jorge cannot believe his good fortune to be granted citizenship to such a great country as, country as Texas. He also states he will have no regrets because since he is Andalusian, there will, be not, there will not be any betrayal on his part. Don Jorge tells me Pilate that he and his Indian uh, friend will lead him through a mountain pass to examine the route which best suits them, while Navarro and his men were prepared to follow. So once again, it's, it's divide and conquer, if you will, but through, through a, a trick. As they make their way through the pass, Menglada notices that the Mexican troops are coming at him at full gallop. Menglada realizes it's all been a trap set by the Indian and Don Jorge, who says to McCloy, Menglada, Muere, pero has de pagar todo lo que han prestado en contra, muy general, Recibirá de escarmiento que no te duras a fiar de los mexicanos, pues si tú los ves ladrar, siempre el extranjero muerde, y no lo pueden dudar. Die, you dog. You will pay for everything you planned against my general. Let this serve as warning that you don't trust New Mexicans, because if you see them bark, they will always bite the foreigner, and you can count on it. As is clear, the play's ending differs from the historical facts of the event. This new conclusion creates a sense of genius for Renato and wins more support for him by the people. It also allows the New Mexicans, the New Mexican audience to satirize the hubristic character of the Texans and how they arrogantly plan to capture Armijo with ease. This ending would allow the audience to not only ridicule the overconfidence of the Texans, but also to take pride in their own ability to outwit a supposedly intellectually and military superior foe. Although Los Tejanos does contain fictitious elements, it also serves as a historical document. It draws on true historical figures such as Hugh McCloy, Jose Antonio Navarro, Governor Juan Guadalajara, and Juan Andres Ochileta. It, also, it is also noteworthy how the fictitious characters of El Indio and, and the Andalus could be trusted by the Texans and expected to commit treason, since they are not part of Amijo's men, and thus, to an extent, extent considered outsiders. But this is also significant because it demonstrates how the new no Mexicano identity was being forged was a, was a product of a Native American and Spanish alliance, something that all New Mexicans can be proud of. In this light, the play Los Tejanos is really about a burgeoning no Mexicano cultural genesis. And as the story goes, it was good. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for
for your time and your patience. I realize that was a lot of material, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. And now I'm open for any questions or comments. My grandmother's grandfather hated Mirabeau Lamar. Okay. He was an Indian agent under President uh, Houston uh, in the first administration and uh, helped the, uh, negotiate the Treaty of Birds Fork. And he had been a captive of the Comanches. And then uh, in the second uh, Houston presidency, he was again an Indian agent, came across a village of Shawnees that had been slaughtered and tracked them down. Uh, the white guys who had done it and killed them. He hung them. Mm. And after that was the Treaty of Tehuacano Creek mm. where the Comanches then signed on because uh, Houston said, you, uh, the negotiators said, well, you know, you can trust the Houston administration. Mm -hmm. Look at him, he, you know. Mm. And so that the, uh, there was very much what you said, very much of a mixed uh, group because his other Indian agent was Luis Sanchez. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, a companionship that went on. It's not acknowledged. But I'm wondering, is that Navarro, is he the same one who Navarro County is named after? Yes. It's named after his father. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, father. He was a legislator. He named Navarro County for his father. So he also became an odd fellow. <laughs> Navarro was? Yeah, uh, they have a picture of it in their in their lodge hall. Anyway, that's yeah, no, in Houston, you know, I find that history fascinating. I mean, uh, Houston, the name is all over. I mean, Houston, then one high school, Sam Houston, the Sam Houston State University. But there's only three, well, now there's a fourth, um, recognized Native American tribes in Texas. Uh, the fourth one just got recognized recently. And it's an Apache, Creek on Apache in South Texas. But one of them is, uh, that actually has land, is the Alabama Cushada. And the reason why they do, it's in Livingston, Texas, which is about an hour north of Houston, an hour and a half, is because um, uh, Houston befriended them, right? And he basically said, don't get involved in, in this war between us and the Mexicans, and, and I'll grant you some land, which he did. So he held true to his word. Uh, but yeah, they were night and day, Houston and Lamar, as far as their relationship with Native Americans. But there were a lot of immigrant tribes that came in, Shawnee, Delaware, Cherokee. Yeah, most of Break off the Comanche, and the, well, Comanche too, but Apache, the only native tribe too there that they exist today. The Kickapoo are really from Wisconsin area, and they're they're down in South Texas. Uh, of course, Isteta de Sur is really from Isteta de Norte. Um, so yeah, but you're right. There there are tribes that eventually people that eventually move down. So. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say that the two Espinosa. Scholars that you refer to are native in Mexico. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, there, and there are amazing scholars. Uh, the Espinosa father and son did an incredible amount of work uncovering all kinds of literature, song, lavados, poetry. Um, they really set the groundwork for people like Enrique La Madrid. Um, and other, other, many other great uh, historians and book course live in the state now, but yeah, they did, they did a tremendous amount of work. They created the language department at Stanford, the father or something. Like yes, that. yeah, the father, and he also founded the journal España, which is probably the biggest journal for Hispanic studies in uh, maybe even the world, I don't know. So they did a lot of great work. Yes, sir, in the back. You mentioned the hubris of the uh, Texan invasion of uh, uh, New Mexico. Wasn't that a factor when in their Civil War invasion that they expected the uh, New Mexicans to flock to their colors? I believe so. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a, an expert on that, or like I said, I'm not really an historian. But uh, you know, uh, people would say that we we still have kind of a hubristic character to ourselves. <laughs> and I've been I've been called out a few times uh, when I've been to New Mexico. Just it's you know, something that. You know, I, I don't know, maybe it's in, ingrained in us somehow. I don't know, but I think that definitely is a part of it. Definitely is a part. Um, and whereas New Mexico was almost the, the opposite of that, um, really uh, relying on uh, interdependence of others. And it's, it's fascinating because I just happened to pick up a book the other day, and many of you are probably familiar with it. I don't remember the author's name because I, I can't pronounce it properly, but it's called The Art of War. Right? It's a famous uh, Chinese book. Uh, that talks about the history of war making and, it, and all these things I'm like wow this is interesting the use of spies uh, having 
a, a moral uh, backing, if you will, for people, which, which they did not, uh, being grounded, if you will. And, and so there's many things that, that Texans did wrong in this war, and that was one of them, just thinking they could travel a thousand miles and conquer another group. Um, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Any other questions or comments? I have just one comment. Yes, In addition to the Espinosas, also the WPA uh -huh. and the New Deal and the FDR saved a lot of those folk plays, traditions, and songs, and they are recorded now uh -huh. in various libraries. Mm -hmm. Ours as well. Okay. Yeah, tons of great stuff. Uh, a lot of great stuff to find. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. If anybody is new today and would like to go on my email list for the next lecture, just give me an email and I'll put you in my database. Thank you.